and good evening, Dr. Prabhadatta. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Good evening, sir. Uh, we are waiting for Dr. Ramakrishna to join. And just once he joins, we can start off, I suppose. I'll just check. Hi, Shushant. Hi, good evening, sir. Hmm. Got it. Hello? Ticket. Ticket. Can I just check with my side slide sharing? Is my slide is visible, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's yes, it. Okay. Looks okay. Yes. Hello? Hello, uh, Dr. Sir. I'm just mm. not. Good evening. 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 Good uh, Madam was there actually here. Good evening, sir. Okay. Yeah, good evening, good evening. How are you? <laughs> yeah, fine, sir. Madam was here only. Uh, I think she has gone somewhere. Yeah, she just called me. Okay. So okay. I am just traveling actually to Karimnagar, but I just pulled my Hello, car. Doctor. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, good evening. Shall we start? Srilata is there, no? Yes, she is, she is joined. Not able to see her uh, video. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. You are audible. So, shall we start, Srilata? Hello? Is it okay? Yes, yes, yes. So good evening, uh, good evening one and all. Welcome to ISA Telangana webinar. This is third, 13th webinar uh, for this year. We have very good uh, speakers today, three speakers on three topics. Uh, we are going in a new format now. We are uh, focusing on lung. So uh, Dr. Srilata, additional professor of uh, anesthesia at Nizams. She is the coordinator for today, moderator. She will uh, introduce the speakers and uh, she will take over the session. Thank you. Thank you, Srilata. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramakrishna. Yeah, uh, we have, as the Dr. Ramakrishna said, uh, we are dealing with the respiratory system and all the topics related to it in the initial uh, uh, webinars. So this is, again, uh, uh, this is, again, an attempt from uh, our side. We'll be dealing with the preoperative investigations and then followed by the uh, anesthesia for lung transplantation, both intraoperative, uh, preoperative, intraoperative, and the postoperative management. And uh, we have first speaker, this is Dr. Umesh. Um, he is a professor in the HOD, the Department of Neuroanesthesia and Dimhans from the Harvard. Um, um, Okay. more than 100 index publications in different national and international journals. And uh, his publications are the most important. He published this uh, 
guidelines for uh, those are the um, guidelines of the I. So I'll I'll request Dr. Umesh to start his speak, start his lecture, and before that, I'd like to say that as we all know, uh, preoperative uh, pre-anesthetic assessment or preoperative assessment, what we call it, it, is an integral part of our planning for anesthesia, mainly for the intraoperative and also the post-operative. So we know that it takes care of the stratification, planning for anesthesia, and also it required optimization of critical ill patients. And in, in that comes the preoperative investigations. And preoperative investigations, what we are seeing is like, um, nowadays, uh, many like battery of investigations are carried away. Uh, it may be required, it may not be required, for the patient management per se. So he has uh, tried uh, this uh, and some recommendations for the preoperative investigations per se. So I request Dr. Humesh to carry on with his uh, lecture. Okay. Thank you, madam. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, good evening. Am I audible? Yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, I'll be sharing the screen now. Good evening to all of you and uh, good evening to Srilata Madam and uh, Gopinath Sir. We are joined. Uh, it's so nice to see first name over here. And yeah, I have been given about 20 minutes to present these uh, guidelines. These are evidence-based guidelines from the Indian Society of Anesthesia. Published uh, in May 2022, just about a couple of months ago. These are evidence-based guidelines regarding preoperative investigations. And uh, the whole scope of these guidelines and the objective was for judicious ordering of investigations. Because India is such a country where we have uh, small nursing home setups and also uh, going up to corporate sectors and the tertiary care uh, specialized centers. So each place has its own way of uh, evaluating the patients prior to investigation. So we thought the guidelines that we are going to prepare should be applicable to all these uh, strata and uh, it should be feasible also. So we wanted to keep in mind the practitioner's uh, perspective also and uh, in, in, it should be in such a way that they are evidence-based also at the same time it should cover for medical legal uh, uh, aspects related to investigations. So that was the idea and these investigations are specifically applicable to only patient population undergoing elective surgical scenarios and uh, those who are belonging to one and two. And we have excluded specialty surgeries like neurosurgery, cardiothoracic surgery, vascular surgery, and transplant surgery because they require a certain set of investigations specific to those particular surgeries. So they cannot be covered under these guidelines. So the main concern was to recommend minimum required routine investigation. That means what these guidelines are, they are starting point. That is, it is not like, you know, an investigation is ordered or not ordered as per the guideline. That doesn't mean that uh, a particular investigation which has been not recommended or not suggested should not be done. Depending upon the patient, the um, patient profile and the surgery, we, the attending anesthesiologist will have the freedom to choose for additional investigations that may be relevant on a case-to-case -case basis. The uh, ASA physical status, one patients usually are quite fit. They don't have any comorbidities. Mostly they will not be on any particular medication that would affect any system. So they uh, these routine investigations that we are going to recommend to stand for ASA physical status, one population. However, when it is ASA physical status two patient, they will have certain comorbidities. They may be having one, they may be having a combination of a couple of comorbidities. In, in, in that scenario, these investigations and in addition to the recommendations, we need to uh, go by the detailed history, clinical evaluation and review of medications and the previous investigations. And based on those things, we might have to order additional investigations based on the comorbidity. And when it is ASA 3 or 4 or 5 patients, they are not fit for elective surgery. So they will be usually referred to specialists for consultation and optimization. And therefore, further testing and to uh, you know ensure that the patient is optimized, it will be in the hands of the specialists. Therefore, they, we felt there was no point in trying to find uh, investigations that are suitable for ASA status. 
three, four, five, and the same way it is for uh, emergency surgeries. And some emergency surgeries may have to be done within um, uh, hours of uh, identifying the problem, while some can wait for several hours for optimization. In such scenarios, and depending on the sector, we need to the surgeon and the anesthesiologist need to take into account the urgency of the surgery, the nature of the surgery, and the underlying or physiological disturbances of the patient, which may vary from patient to patient. And therefore, they can take informed decision about which investigations to do. In in emergency scenarios, and if at all investigation is ordered, should we wait for the investigation report to come, or should we proceed with the surgery? This will remain uh, with the Just freedom of the anesthesiologist. Now, screening tests are not focus of these guidelines. Screening test means you know testing for COVID, or testing for HIV, HKCG, viral markers, and things like that. That that was not the focus of these guidelines, so we have not uh, included those things. and because pediatric population bariatric population and obstetric population they have uh, their physiology is sort of different from uh, other normal adult population they require uh, some disturbance is it okay. for everyone or yeah, some is better? streaming is coming yeah so okay sir now yes sir right thank you yeah Uh, because pediatric bariatric and obstetric population have a, a slightly different physiology compared to the normal adult population that we day to day cater to during anesthesia uh, they may need uh, additional investigations and maybe uh, uh, a different set of investigations and guidelines may be necessary for this population so again they are not considered as part of these uh, guidelines so uh, initially as a part of team work we prepared 10 research questions and we had identified 16 subject experts from across the country and there were seven core committee members so each research question was divided um, into a group of two to three subject experts and they um, did the literature review with the help of core committee members and then um, uh, you know the search uh, criteria involved january 2010 up to november 2021 all the studies that were published in full text in english they were considered and only if they involved data specifically related to as a physical status one and two patients scheduled for two surgical procedure excluding neurocardio uh, uh, and transplant surgery such uh, articles were uh, retrieved and then they underwent systematic review from the core committee and the experts and wherever applicable meta analysis was done and then lastly we did grading of these things as per the grade criteria for this we took help of dr garden gayat who is actually father of this uh, grade recommendation system and uh, we had two meetings with him virtual meeting and he guided us as to how to go about to doing this uh, uh, grading of the recommendations and finally we prepared draft recommendations when draft recommendations were made see when a uh, research question was allotted to a group of two to three subject experts and seven core committee members so overall about nine members discussed about each research question and uh, did systematic review and came to a particular uh, recommendation but then just to be sure that we have not overlooked something or have not misinterpreted the data we uh, compiled the systematic review for all the 10 research questions and gave it to all the 16 subject experts and then we gave the draft recommendations to each of them to independently comment on whether the recommendation is as per the systematic review or certain changes are necessary and then once we obtained a majority consensus from all the experts that yes this particular draft recommendation is all right as per the systematic review then a final recommendations were given and when we had uh, data from several studies one of the major concerns that we had was the, uh, uh, different types of surgeries were involved and we cannot be ordering the same set of investigation for somebody who undergoes a surgery and somebody who undergoes a extensive laparotomy surgery which may be elective uh, in nature so we needed to categorize the surgeries uh, into minor intermediate and major surgeries so for that purpose so there was no particular evidence so what we did we did a, a google survey among the uh, 16 subject experts and in each independently Uh, found we collected about 30 to 40 commonly performed the surgical procedures in the indian setup and we gave them to them and they categorized them into minor intermediate and major wherever we had more than 75% consensus that particular surgery was allotted to uh, that particular uh, uh, group of surgical uh, uh, categories 
so once this was done we uh, um, from the recommendations so the first research question was to address in asa physical status 1 and 2 patients who are scheduled to undergo elective surgery will routine preoperative uh, complete blood count testing change anesthetic management or the patient outcomes following surgery so complete blood count testing when we saw the review of literature some uh, studies had focused on hemoglobin TLC, DLC, and platelets as individual components, whereas most of the studies had concentrated on CBC as a whole. Now, for uh, coming to recommendations, we wanted to know the Indian perspective. So we had done a nationwide survey, and in that survey, we found that almost 75 to 80 percent of the anesthesiologists who are practicing in India they prefer doing CBC and not individual components, and therefore the recommendation is. preoperative cbc testing is suggested for patients undergoing minor intermediate and major surgery that means irrespective of which surgery the patient undergoes at least cbc has to be done now uh, it is little bit questionable whether why why somebody undergoing a major surgery like you know toe excision or something like that why should they require cbc that's because we did uh, the prevalence of anemia was studied in india and we found that almost 14% of the pre operative asa physical status 1 and 2 patients coming for elective surgery have anemia below 9 uh, gram percent hemoglobin and therefore uh, the uh, recommendation is for even minor uh, uh, surgery so the second question addressed the renal function test now when we discuss about renal function test we usually do blood urea and serum creatinine so blood urea can be altered when somebody is dehydrated or somebody has a liver disease so it is not a specific marker for renal function also estimated uh, gfr also considers the serum creatinine so we took serum creatinine as a uh, best marker for renal function testing and the recommendation is that pre operative serum creatinine estimation is not suggested for patients undergoing minor surgery now we had more than 25000 patients undergoing minor surgery in these studies and there uh, uh, many of them had undergone renal function testing pre operatively and about 20 or 30 of them in among those 25000 patients did have altered serum creatinine value to a extent of 1.1 but their outcomes did not differ in any way neither did the anesthetic management and therefore the recommendation is it is not suggested for patients undergoing minor surgery however it is suggested for patients undergoing intermediate and major surgery now regarding serum electrolytes so mainly we do serum sodium and potassium so we had uh, uh, literature available for specifically serum sodium and potassium testing and the recommendation is that uh, the preoperative estimation just like that routinely uh, does not change the anesthetic management or the outcomes of the patients and therefore it is not suggested for patient undergoing any of these surgical procedures however at the same time Uh, suppose if somebody is a hypertensive patient and they are on AC inhibitors, then yes, the attending anesthesiologist knows that um, it is uh, uh, worthwhile doing serum electrolytes, and therefore, in such scenarios, the attending anesthesiologist can order serum electrolytes. Um, on the other hand, it may be an ASF because status one patient, not on any medication, uh, uh, healthy patient, but because the patient is undergoing transuretral resection of prostate. Now we know that it will involve irrigation of fluids and variable degree of uh, fluid will be absorbed systemically therefore in such scenario again the anesthesiology should take into consideration the surgical concerns and can order for pre operative electrolytes other than these few examples most of the time it is it is not necessary to do serum electrolytes pre operatively now liver function testing a very clear evidence was available for this so pre operative liver function testing is not suggested for patients undergoing minor and intermediate surgery while it is suggested for patients undergoing major surgery uh, the coagulation profile uh, when we were doing post graduation bt ct were also considered but now uh, because of, um, uh, point of care testing is available and most of the laboratories are equipped with coagulation profile testing for ptinr and apttt we considered uh, pt apttt as the best markers for coagulation profile and uh, the evidence uh, is uh, clear that uh, routinely doing these tests does not alter the anesthetic management or anesthetic plan or the patient outcomes and therefore it is not just for the surgeries 
But again, if a patient has to undergo, say, central neuraxial block or racial anesthesia, and if the patient is on any medication, it might alter the coagulation profile or any particular disease is uh, likely to alter, then the attending anesthesiologist should refer to the available guidelines for regional anesthesia and anticoagulation. And based on that, they can order investigations. The sixth research question was related to blood glucose estimation. Now, if somebody is a known diabetic, there is no question about uh, asking for preoperative blood sugar estimation. It has to be done. There is no doubt at all. But what if it is a non-diabetic? What do we mean by non-diabetic is if we take a detailed history, we evaluate the patient and then we review the previous reports and uh, the medications that the patient may be on. And none of that is suggesting of diabetes. Then in such patients, if we do fasting blood sugar, would that affect the anesthetic management of the patient outcome of the surgery? Now, what we found in the literature was so around, uh, around 17,000 patients were uh, non-diabetic and for them, uh, random sugar or fasting sugar was done. And maybe about 40 to 50 patients did have uh, uh, altered blood sugars, like you know, 150, 180, something like that. But it did not affect the anesthetic management of the outcome. So routinely just like that ordering blood glucose estimation is not suggested for patients undergoing any of the three types of surgical categories now research question seven was related to 12 lead electrocardiogram testing now again if somebody has anything suggestive of a cardiac problem cardiac or vascular problem it may be myocarditis it may be ischemia it may be arrhythmia or it may be anything related to the heart it may even be uh, pulmonary hypertension heart pulmonary in such scenario there is no doubt that early ecg needs to be done but if the patient is non-cardiac again by non-cardiac we mean when we evaluate the patient and review the medications and lab reports and we find that nothing is suggestive of any underlying cardiac disease do Early DCG be, uh, uh, doing early DCG just like that routinely, will that make any influence? Now, the evidence was very strong that yes, it is not need to be, it does not need to be done at all, just like that. But on the other hand, when we found the, uh, uh, the prevalence of ischemic heart disease and cardiovascular uh, pathology in the Indian population, India is likely to become capital of cardiovascular diseases in patients aged 45 years and above. It is found that at the age of 45 and above, the incidence of cardiovascular diseases definitely increases in our population. And therefore, we altered the guideline as per uh, this evidence. And therefore, it is suggested to do only DCG at age 45 year and above for those patients, even if they don't have any cardiac history or evaluation findings even then routinely it needs to be done for patients aged 45 years and above if they are scheduled to undergo minor or intermediate surgery however if they are undergoing major surgery then totally dcg needs to be done for uh, irrespective of uh, age for all patients the eighth research question was related to chest x-ray testing again see india uh, tuberculosis is endemic we have so much of uh, active and passive uh, smoking happening in our country and a lot of air pollution is there and some industrial pollution also may be there. So because of this, from childhood, we will have certain degree of exposure. And if we do routine chest x-rays, we may find some mild pathology here and there in several of the patients. But by doing this elective chest x-ray testing and finding some pathology, will that alter the evidence, uh, the, the outcome of the surgery or the anesthetic management was the question that we needed to address. Now, uh, uh, what we find is, although there may be some pathology here and there, if the patient's uh, physical uh, effort tolerance is good, then it is highly unlikely that this would benefit the patients. And therefore, preoperative chest X-ray testing is not suggested for patients undergoing minor surgery. However, for patients undergoing intermediate and major surgery, maybe when the patient reaches 50 years and above, it is likely that the, the, the chances of the abnormalities affecting the management may be high. And therefore, it was uh, suggested. Now, this was the only recommendation that was not evidence-based, but this was consensus-based with our experts. Uh, now, the first of the recommendation that has come regarding preoperative investigation among all the international guidelines is related to ultrasonography. And we wanted to see whether preoperative routine ultrasonographic airway scanning will help in predicting difficult airway. Now, in that study period of about 11 and a half years, we had 22 publications related to preoperative ultrasound airway assessment in routine population. 
and all of them overwhelmingly in fact 20 out of 22 of them were very clearly pointing to the fact that routine ultrasonographic airway evaluation is a much better predictor of difficult airway that is specifically difficult laryngoscopy that is poor cormac lehen view or laryngoscopy compared to any of or one or combination of the clinical parameters that we routinely use that is lemon malampati and all other uh, uh, evaluations there is no doubt about that however uh, when it came to which particular ultrasonography measurement or parameter has the conclusive evidence there is nothing all the 20 studies had a different different parameters and so it is a evolving field maybe in the next few years we may be able to narrow down to two or three particular parameters by ultrasound which may be helpful in predicting difficult laryngoscopy plus considering the practitioner's perspective that in india it is because of pndt act it is not available everywhere even where it is available it may not be available in every operating location and our anesthesiologists need to train and become skilled and confident in ultrasonographic airway assessment so keeping all these points in view uh, the current recommendation is it is not suggested for predicting difficult laryngoscopy the last research question that we address again this is the first Uh, of the recommendation no other guideline has addressed this issue that is validity time for pre s investigation by validity time what we mean is a patient is scheduled for surgery in the next one week or so and so you have a patient has come to you for pre anesthetic evaluation if the patient had undergone some testing for various reasons maybe just like that he got it done or must have undergone Uh, some uh, disease and uh, got evaluated or uh, underwent some surgery or some procedure a uh, couple of months ago now whether we can rely on those investigations for the current surgical procedure or should we repeat them this was the question that we needed to address so uh, we found two uh, specific studies addressing this issue and one study had 2 lakh 35000 plus patients who are asps1 and scheduled to undergo elective surgery in them they tried doing these investigations uh, and compared them to what was done one month ago two month ago three month ago and four month ago and uh, what they found was most of these blood tests that we do um, if they were done about two months ago and the patient's clinical condition has remained the same it has not changed it has not deteriorated in such uh, scenarios it is okay to accept the previous investigation which was done uh, about two months or uh, less than two months ago it won't change the outcome otherwise by doing the uh, repeat investigation in in such patients similarly for ecg and x ray uh, what uh, this report suggested was uh, if the patient condition has not changed in the intervening period 12 month gap is okay if one year ago or 10 months or 12 months ago an ecg or x ray was done and patient has remained stable in the intervening period no need to repeat the uh, ecg or chest x ray again for the current scheduled surgical procedure so this particular table summarizes the guidelines um, uh, here we have the nature of surgery minor intermediate and major and here is the list of investigations green boxes represent they are suggested and amber boxes represent they are not suggested so these are our guidelines and we just brought them in the month of may 2022 and we hope that it will help our practitioners to do judicious ordering of investigations and cut down on unnecessary investigations and it will also protect them from medical legal hassles so thank you very much for giving me this opportunity uh, dr shilata madam thank you uh, you can take over yeah thank you mish um, yeah it's a very nice presentation and like uh, you said uh validity of these investigations and the rationale behind uh, getting these investigations done we need to justify why we want to do them and whether it's really affecting uh, the outcome of the patient uh, like i have uh, one to queries like nowadays we are getting a lot of uh, post covid patients so we don't know many of them are coming with vague presentations and even uh, recently we had a semi emergency case of acute appendicitis young uh, young man sorry i lost uh, i i couldn't we, hear it was a acute appendicitis and young patient beyond that i, I couldn't hear because you're seeing a lot of 
come other changes. But this patient, like particularly, didn't had any history, no history of any chest pain. Thing, but patient. And finally, we did an echo. Actually, we found it that we. Madam, there is some audio problem. Yeah, sorry, I I couldn't hear, madam. I I found that yes, patient was asymptomatic. You did a echocardiography, and what was the finding? I couldn't hear. Am I audible? I think it got yes, disconnected. Yes. Yeah, there is some disturbance in the audio. Uh, lot of uh, disturbance is there. Like I was asking, like nowadays, like post COVID patients, no, uh, we get lot of um, changes in the investigations per se, or in the history. In the history, if it comes, it's fine. But in the investigations, if some changes are coming up, um, whether. Uh, we justify in doing these investigations per se, or maybe again, there may be a again review of literature, maybe later to get more recommendations per se. As of now, we did go through all this data and we find that these are just starting points for any uh, patient. So based on uh, the symptomatology of the patient and the history of the patient, any additional investigation needs to be done Definitely, it can be considered. Every anesthesiologist should feel free to ask for any additional investigation based on a case by case basis. So we didn't want to uh, include some investigation which is applicable to all the ASA one and two patients. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Give us inputs, maybe. Did you ask anything? No, yeah, I was asking Dr. Gopinath. Gopinath sir is here, no? You would like to yes, give us input? Yeah, sir has unmuted. Sir, your, your audio, yeah. I think your uh, bandwidth is very low. Maybe if you cut off your video, you'll be your audio bandwidth, bandwidth will be better. Okay, sir. Yeah, that. yeah that's it. Yes, now it will be better. Uh, oh, yes, I, I think uh, the, po the COVID patient or post-COVID patient, anybody with a history of COVID-19 uh, should be dealt with because cardiovascular complications in the post-COVID patient are definitely seen. So they should be looked at in a different entity already. And anybody with such history, you should ask for all relevant investigations which pertain to the cardiovascular system. So I think in those patients, you uh, there is this, uh, I think the recommendations are very robust for those with no such ailments or no such history, but post-COVID or long COVID, definitely they need to be looked at uh, differently. So that is, I think, my observation about the patient because we have also had similar problems post-COVID. So, or had some patients who came up with some surprises even on uh, routine investigations. So that is one. But, uh, the other was, though the recommendations are very valid, and for a diverse population or country like us, from PhDs to nursing homes to corporates to academic institutions, I think it's uh, the one, one comment I had was that there are lots of hospitals which have a surgical package or a pre-operative pre package. So they generally seem to include uh, every investigation that we have listed. And uh, though it is not recommended, it is done as a routine. Maybe it is a sort of, you know, ploy to earn or screen or whatever it is, but uh, this should not uh, be a sort of, you know, social sciences exercise of picking up uh, as a patient coming to do a master health checkup. So sometimes we do have all the investigations that are, uh, you know, disposal. So that is one finding that I thought we should comment on, though we have a choice of asking them what investigations are required, but most often I found that uh, every investigation that you need is probably already available. The second is, uh, my concerns uh, are that most patients, ASA 1 or 2, hospitalized, we do recommend uh, sort of minor or intermediate surgery to be having or receiving thromboprophylaxis. So these are the ones who generally get a needle in the back. 
so and if they are uh, or staying there welcome for you know pre operatively for two or three days then i would be a little cautious of asking and ask for uh, you know a coagulation status or something so that is something that uh, i wanted to add so whenever some i think uh, dr umesh did mention it very specifically those receiving central axial or other blocks should be uh, you know uh, we should seek uh, appropriate investigations as required so the idea of my bringing in this was just to remind everybody that uh, thromboprophylaxis is a part of preoperative uh, management or uh, care of a patient and we should look at it separately or uh, definitely consider that as uh, as an indication for uh, any coagulation profile or specific test that you want thank you dr umesh that was a very nice talk i think you summed up uh, the whole thing it was a very elaborate exercise i know we have gone through a similar ones for uh, no guidelines so it's a, it's a stumongous process congratulations for that thank you thank you sir sir every point you addressed was uh, precise actually so i don't think i can add even a word to that everything was perfectly valid thank you sir thank you umesh it's a very nice presentation thank you madam next uh, we'll go move to the next speaker he is dr shushan panda and he is a consultant in the department of anesthesia heart and lungs transplant unit in kim sikandarabad and uh, i'd like to say that their team like uh, along with dr prabhat datta mahesh chandra and his team in two months back they have completed uh, more than 100 combined heart and lung transplants so i think uh, they are the best people who can tell us about their experience and how how they have evolved from the first transplant to the 100th transplant what are the practical problems and what are the different uh, pre and post covid patients for in the covid patients what how they have uh, i i thought they are the best people who can uh, give uh, justification to their uh, talks so panda the lung transplant so sushant dr sushant are yeah. you ready yeah okay ma'am i'm cr man slides Yeah, is it is it visible now? Yes, sir. Yeah, full screen also visible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, full screen. Right. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Sujata, ma'am, and ISA Telangana team for giving me opportunity to present in this webinar. And uh, good evening to everyone. Dr. Gopinath sir is here. He is my teacher also. And good evening to everyone again. <clears throat> in next 25 20 25 minutes i am going to talk about anesthesia for lung transplantation so uh, as you can see this is a data from the iscld the evaluation of the lung transplant uh, it was a very rare procedure during the period of around 90s 1990s 1980s but from the year 1990 to 2000 uh, we have done around 11000 patients to, uh, uh, surgery total but now if you can compare this with today from 2010 to 2017 or 18 we have completed around 34000 and uh, long transplant and you can see here uh, this uh, blue the blue the bar diagram is the double lung transplant and the green is the single lung transplantation and you can see the number of the double lung transplant is completely slowly increasing as compared to single lung transplant because of the better survivability if you are doing a dia double lung transplant <laughs> and also the the indications for the single lung transplant is limited so the popularity of the double lung transplant is slowly increasing and uh, the survival survivability also slowly increasing because of the upgrade of our knowledge and understanding the median survival after a primary transplant lung transplant is around 6.7 year uh, but the mortality we see in the first year is around 20% and the mortality is because because of the first of infection second is the by the primary graft dysfunction or it may be because of the multi organ dysfunction so if the patient survive in the first year after that 
the median survival year is 8.9 year 8.9 year so this is a very good survivability if the patient survive the first year of the transplant so it is uh, uh, the number is also increasing in the india as you can see the first lung transplant was done by Dr. KMGN in 1999. But from the 2007, we can see here the number is continuously increasing. And also in Telangana also, we can see here, though we have done maximum transplant in the year of 2020 during the time of COVID. So it's a, it's a, it's a very higher time, I think, to update our knowledge and skill in the lung transplant. And uh, that's why we are probably doing here. Uh, we are going to discuss about uh, the pre-op preparation of the patient. Uh, induction, or whether to go for on pump or off pump surgery, wall lung ventilation strategies, implantation of the lungs, uh, and then reperfusion, what are the steps for that, and coming up bypass, and finally, whether to restart a ECMO or continue ECMO, or we can uh, come up bypass and give protamine, and in that we'll discuss. Now, coming to the pre op preparation, uh, whenever we get a call from the, uh, from the donor, uh, donor call, uh, from any hospital. First of all, we inform the recipient that uh, and keep the recipient an uh, NPO and ask, the, ask them to come to the hospital. By that time, our retrieval team goes to the donor hospital and check with the uh, organ, whether the organ is good or not. Once we get a green signal for the retrieve from the retrieval team, the person in the, the team in, the, uh, in our hospital, they start with the preparation of the uh, recipient. Uh, we just put a big, uh, big IV, line and a radial light and uh, start with antibiotic for what was, uh, what was the plan for the patient earlier and start with the immunosuppression of mycophenolate uh, sodium 180 milligram tablet. Now shifting the patient to the OT, I probably this is the one of the most important steps when to shift the patient to the OT. This will be ideally two to two and a half before the organ reaching to the hospital. Two to two and a half hour before the reaching to the hospital because it should not we should not increase the ischemia time of the organ. Uh, it should be properly coordinated with the retrieval team and also the surgeon because sometimes there may be some adhesions of the lungs to the chest wall and surgeon might take a little longer time. So we have to take the patient early to the OT if, we have, if, if, if the surgeon says that we, I may take a little more time for the dissection. So this should be properly planned when to ship the patient to the OT. Now, we should be very much sure about the uh, ischemia time. What is the ischemia time? This is the starting from the aortic clostrum of the donor to the reperfusion of the lung. So, ischemia time should be as low as possible. This is our goal to prevent the post of primary graft dysfunction or organ dysfunction. So, it should be six hours or less than six hours. This is our primary goal in any cost. So, proper coordination and uh, communication with the team is paramount importance. Now, again, before shifting the patient, check the OR setup. Uh, everything, all the instruments, emergency drugs, and all the airway gadgets should be available. Then only we shift the patient to the OT. Now, induction. This is probably the most important step during the lung transplant uh, procedure because uh, all our NCD drugs we know that decrease the cardiac output because of the either suppression of the sympathetic system or because of the pressure dilation or myocardial depression or after induction, we may give the positive pressure ventilation. All the things decrease the cardiac output in one way. And on the simultaneously, during the intubation, it may increase the PVR or because of the lighter plane of anesthesia, hypoxia, hypercapnia, and acidosis. All the things increase the PVR. So this is a perfect recipe probably to decrease the coronary perfusion on the right side. Coronary perfusion pressure is basically diastolic blood pressure. When it, the cardiac output decreases, diastolic blood pressure decreases. So diastolic blood pressure minus CVP, CVP will go up with the increase of PVR. So coronary perfusion pressure decreases and patient crash immediately. So we have to be very careful during the induction. It should be gradually created, graded induction of the patient. And we should always keep in the mind that the patient may have RV dysfunction. So uh, the induction should be smooth. Uh, it should be slow, gradual, and uh, the, uh, all the you know, inductions will be narcotic based. We usually use fentanyl, mirazolam, and etomidate. And uh, muscle resistant, usually, we use vicodinin. One more thing you should remember here is uh, the role of the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. Uh, this is a this is a uh, protective mechanism during one lung ventilation, and, it, and if you are increasing the volatile anesthetics more than one mic that will decrease the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So we should remember this and should not increase our volatile anesthetics during maintenance phase. So after induction, 
and after, uh, uh, after intubation also one of the best in the stimulage we start with our induction dose of immunosuppression bacillus at 20 mg now the next important step is the lung isolation we have two choices basically either to put a double lumen tube or a bronchial blocker we use we prefer usually left sided dlt because the positioning is easy as compared to the bronchial blocker because in bronchial blockers you know we have to uh, you have to uh, use the bronchoscope all the time for proper positioning now once uh, 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 intubation is done uh, we put the uh, one uh, igv if there is no ecmo we put the right side of the igv uh, igv line is yes, line or uh, there is ecmo we put the left side uh, cvp line and one femoral arterial line and then uh, we go for the positioning of the patient the positioning of the patient should be uh, supine if you are going for a uh, bilateral sequential lung transplant or uh, it may be lateral decubitus if you are going for a single lung transplant which we are not doing nowadays single lung transplant most of the uh, surgery is double lung transplant the position should be supine and the uh, uh, incision should be uh, incision is clam cell incision and there is a bilateral transternal lower anterior thoracotomy and the arms are padded and suspended above the head of the patient now the role of the TEE, transgeneral echocardiography, is of immense value. Uh, uh, first, before transplantation, we check out the whether the, the PFO is present or not and check with the LVRB function and the pulmonary vents. This is for the baseline references, and in this we compare with the post-op anastomosis once we're done with the transplant. So intra-procedural. Uh, we check with the volume status and the most important step of most important step that is the whether to decide whether to go on pump or off pump that is by right ventricular response to clamping pa uh, before uh, going on pump usually we check uh, the response of the right ventricle when the surgeon clamps the pulmonary artery so if there is a increase in the chamber right ventricular chamber size or if there is chamber dilatation or increase in the uh, tricuspid TRZ or decrease in contractility by decreasing the TAPSI or if a PFO is present there is some reversal that means the patient has severe RV dysfunction so we should be careful for that. So if you see this picture like this uh, is a video of uh, right ventricle suppose it is right ventricle is dilated along with that it is hypertrophic with a lot of trabeculation. So this is a probably chronic hypertensive patient and this test patients may tolerate open surgery. But if we see here, uh, we see here the RV is dilated once we put a clamp and it is thin out RV. So this type of patient will not tolerate op pump surgery. There will be a lot of, lot of computer disturbances and better we have to go on pump. So other, other uh, use of uh, TE is during the DRing procedures and after the transplant, we assess all the pulmonary valve well anastomosis. Uh, pulmonary artery anastomosis and uh, again the LPL RV function. Uh, the intra complications is uh, primarily because of the uh, disease process. Uh, suppose, in, uh, suppose you are operating for a obstructive lung disease like a COPD or emphysema. The main problem here is gas trapping because it develops auto peep. So uh, suppose we get a uh, CT scan previously before induction like this, there's a lung, there's a big bully subcularly. So be careful, the patient may develop uh, uh, a tensor neothorax immediately after induction. So if you are the, the patient developing hypotension, keep in mind that it may have a tensor pneumothorax. Or the, if you are one year inducing a restrictive lung disease like pulmonary fibrosis, there may be, we, we may have to give high, uh, high ventilatory pressure, high, uh, PKRA pressure, uh, maybe more than 40 centimeters of water to maintain saturation. But the problem with this is when you increase the PKRA pressure, there will be reduced venous return and cardiac output will decrease. So you have to, it's a tight balance between the uh, how much pressure you are giving and how much the cardiac output you are maintaining. It's a tight balance, you have to adjust that. The, in, in case of superlative lung disease like the cystic fibrosis, there may be copious secretion which may impair gas exchange. So you have to do frequent toileting of the lung. Maybe before putting the double lumen tube, tube, you may put a single lumen tube and do a thorough bronchial toileting by a bronchoscopy. And then again, we replace with the double lumen tube. 
Now, the most feared uh, disease is probably this pulmonary hypertension. If the patient has pulmonary hypertension and uh, it is not compensated properly, the RV uh, functioning poorly, the, the patient may suddenly collapse during induction when there is decrease in cardio output and increase in PVI. So you have to be very, very careful during induction of these type of patients. Now, this is, now once we induce the patient and uh, then we have to decide whether to uh, go on pump or on pump. On pump, we have option of either do on, on ECMO or bypass or off pump surgery. So this is a recent article that is published in Journal of Surgical Cardiovascular Surgery in February 2022. And they have compared uh, from eight different centers, 852 patients. Then they compare the percentage of cases with primary grad dysfunction grade three uh, at 48 and 72 hours after reperfusion. And what they found was uh, the primary graft dysfunction grade three was much higher when the patient is undergoing cardiopulmonary bypass during surgery. And it is uh, medium around 28% uh, when we touch it ECMO. And it is lowest if there is, we are doing with the op pump surgery. So op pump surgery definitely it's better according to them. But the problem with the op pump surgery is hemodynamic maintenance. Most of the time, if the, if the patient going on hypotension and it is prolonged, this will manifest in the post-op, like the renal dysfunction, and patient might develop stroke also. So what we have planned is we do most of our procedure under VA ECMO, most of the patients. So th this, is, this is the average short-term compare when you compare both with the CPU with the top pump. Another study, it is published in actually anesthesia and analgesia in uh, uh, sorry, in general thoracic cardiovascular surgery. This is in 2014. They compare again the CPP with the ECMO. And you can see here the blood transfusion units are decreased when we are using ECMO. And the hospital stay along with the ventilator base are less as compared to cardiopulmonary. So, uh, mo most of the cases we prefer our uh, surgery to do under BA ECMO. Now, coming to the surgical sequences. Uh, uh, in double lung transplant, uh, double lung sequential lung transplant, the first lung, uh, first the surgeon do first bronchial surfaces, followed by a pulmonary vein. Usually a cup is produced from, from the two pulmonary veins and uh, switch out to the left atrium. And finally, the pulmonary artery. And uh, after that, after the first lung transplant, uh, anastomosis, we do uh, uh, de-airing process and deperfusion. So before starting, this is again one of the important steps of reperfusion of the first lung. Uh, we give a methyl around 250 milligram to 500 milligram, uh, uh, according to the body weight actually, and uh, 30 minutes before the uh, reperfusion. And surgeon will release the PA. Uh, surgeon will release PA with uh, pulmonary, uh, pulmonary veins still open to assault preservatives and DLB. And close pulmonary vein. Uh, and gradually release the PA uh, clump to receive full perfusion. So at the time we check with the TE when, whether there is uh, air is there or not, and we we'll wait uh, till completely there uh, with head down position. And uh, one we are happy with the uh, once we are happy with the DA, and we start with the one lung ventilation or the new lung ventilation with uh, with lowest FIO2 possible of around 35 to 40% and a low tidal volume of around 150 to 200 ml in adult patient. And we start simultaneously with the nitric oxide around 20 to 40 per, per million. Now uh, the same procedure will be repeated on the opposite side, uh, opposite lung. And uh, when uh, when it's when it done reperfusion with the both the lungs, we start with the re-expansion of the both uh, both the lungs and if I have to as low as possible to maintain a saturation of at least ninety two or more. So we try to maintain the peak airway pressure less than twenty five uh, and uh, tidal volume of five to six ml per kg and feed six to eight. That's routine what we do in most of the cases. But the most important thing here is you should remember that patient may develop hypertension at this time due to palmoplegia washout. Inflammatory mediators, mediators from the lungs of air embolization can happen, and patient may develop RV dysfunction because of maybe air embolism. So we may have to start basal pressure or ionotropes at this time and get ready for the coming up bypass. But before that, we check with the, all the TE, TE with all the pulmonary veins and the pulmonary artery. So if you see here, this is a, a four chamber, uh, uh, is a four chamber view and. Uh, uh, angle is around 40 to 60 degree. You can see the 
the left of our pulmonary vein. The, it is a very nice probe, and you can put the pulsual Doppler. Uh, you can see here if the velocity is less than one, then uh, then probably there is no obstruction. We can see here the S wave is less than D wave. That means that there will be little obstruction is there, but that's okay. Uh, uh, the, if the velocity is still uh, less than one, we accept this. But if you can see here, there's another pulmonary, typical pulmonary event. If the the uh, flow is really compromised here. And when you put a, when you, when you pursue a Doppler, we can see clearly it has gone above one, one meter per second, the velocity. So in this case, we have to be very careful if there is an obstruction in the pulmonary event, post-op, uh, the patient develop hypoxia, pulmonary edema, and all the problems stop, uh, decrease the PF ratio. So we have to be very sure before closing the chest that there should not be any pulmonary venous obstruction. Communicate with the surgeon if you can redo it. Now this is the left upper pulmonary vein, left lower pulmonary vein. Uh, it's, it's like a uh, inverted V step when we uh, see when we finally check with the uh, pulmonary vein anastomosis. Uh, this is the right side pulmonary vein. So again, the same thing we have to check with the uh, flow first. If, uh, any turbulence is there or not? You can see here a little bit turbulence is there and check with the uh, pulse rate Doppler. And if there is uh, <clears throat> Increase in the uh, velocity, then you have to communicate with the surgeon. Finally, we check with the uh, pulmonary artery, main pulmonary artery, and osmosis. And you can see here, this is the right pulmonary artery. Left pulmonary artery, we cannot visualize because of the left main bronchus. And this is again, we can see here some obstruction is there. And uh, in the different patient, we can see clearly the flow is very nice. If you are seeing this type of flow, we are very happy in the post op view. Now, one more important. Uh, issue that can develop at this time is uh, primary graft dysfunction, which may occur within 10 to 30 minutes after the lethal vision till uh, two to three uh, days of the uh, uh, surgery. So the most common cause here is because of the poor lung pre preservation and increasing ischemia time. So you have to be very careful uh, to keep the ischemia time as low as possible for our better outcome. About the upper primary graft dysfunction, Dr. Dutta will discuss about this in a better way. We're going to the bypass, uh, uh, coming up bypass. So it, it is a routine like what we do for the all cardiac surgeon patients and get ready with the inotopes, ventilation, and uh, ABG, it should be any uh, SOCs or potassium, hypocalemia, it should be corrected. Check with the TE, all the pulmonary bands, pulmonary artery, it should be okay. Uh, LB or RB function is okay, whether or not the study started or not. And finally, if you are happy, uh, we'll try to come up bypass. Uh, finally, we uh, change uh, the double lumen tube with a single lumen tube and I request the uh, pulmonologist to have a bronchoscopy. And finally, we we'll check uh, with the uh, anastomosis site. Uh, we we'll check is, is there any bleeding or any, uh, any clots are there in the is the left side of the lung. Uh, uh, and uh, I check with the both side anastomosis. And uh, uh, especially if there is a, uh, there is pink for the flop, uh, for the secretions are there that may be indication of the uh, uh, primary graft dysfunction. Uh, and uh, after that, we'll decide uh, whether to restart VV ECMO or not. Uh, so, so suppose there is hypoxia, hypercapnia, or compliance is less, less than 20 or uh, 20 uh, compliance, or bronchospore is showing there is a, a chance of uh, a PGD, uh, primary graft dysfunction, or TE if there is RV dysfunction, so all the things, if you are present, then we plan to restart the baby ECMO uh, along with the combination commentation of the surgeons and pulmonologists. So finally, whether to keep the chest open or closed, that will decide according to the size of the lung. If, uh, if there is no disproportion between the donor and the recipient side, we close the, close the chest. Uh, if the size is bigger, we wait for another uh, 24 to 48 hours to close the chest. Finally, insert the NG tube and ship the patient to the ICU. So to summarize, uh, all these patients have limited cardiovascular reserves and can have a cardiovascular collapse during induction. After induction, if hypotension, always think in the mind, pneumothorax in case of COPD or RV dysfunction in all the patients. Incidence of post-primary graft dysfunction is less with uh, op-pump surgery and it is most with and cardiopulmonary bypass. ECMO support during operation has low incidence of bleeding, 
primary guard dysfunction, ventilator disc, hospital ICU stay, as compared to cardiopulmonary bypass. PGD occurs in around 10 to 30% of patients, mostly due to poor lung preservation and prolonged ischemia time. And continue with the VB ECMO uh, post-op if there is severe primary guard dysfunction, high PA pressure, poor PA pressure, low compliance. So ultimately the communication, coordination with the team, that is the most important thing, and timely taking proper decision is the key of success to any transplant program. Thank you everyone, this is my references. And uh, we are conducting a, uh, a uh, Indian Society of Heart and Lung Transplant uh, annual conference on December, uh, so uh, on December 3rd and 4th uh, uh, of uh, this year. So uh, anybody interested, please join with us. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you, Dr. Sushant. It's a very nice presentation, precise presentation. Some like a uh, horse. Am I audible? Yeah, some disturbance is there, ma'am. Your voice is a little breaking. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, it's better now. Yeah. I was just asking how you have evolved from the first uh, transplant Good. to the last uh, hundred. More than that. What are the challenges you have faced? And... Uh, actually, uh, mm, when we started during the COVID time, uh, the number was really less for around two months. But once we start, when we, uh, when we start with the uh, first case, um, then slowly, slowly, definitely it has gone up. And uh, that's the time actually we get, uh, we got the patient uh, from all over the India, uh, uh, all the COVID patients. Uh, and at a time, we used to run around 14 to 15 ECMO at a time in the ICU. So at that time, uh, during the COVID time, the number was uh, really, uh, really high. And it was a top time for us, uh, all the anesthesiologists and the team. Uh, but yes, at that time, uh, the learning was uh, ultimately probably we never get this type of numbers uh, of our lung transplantation in our life, uh, what we get during the COVID time. So this was really challenging at that time, but we have a lot of experience at that time also. After, uh, the professor, you want to tell anything about this? No, actually, we started doing lung transplant in 2017 in Chennai. So our team has shifted in just two years back. So last August, uh, 2020 August, we did the first lung transplant in the Kims. But by that time, the team came, we already had an experience of more than 100 lung transplant. So we replicated most of the things, but obviously, logistic problem was there. So slowly, slowly, we picked it up. Hello. Hello. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Any other question we have? Uh, lot of uh, technical problems are going on, so most of the yeah. things are not uh, heard. Uh, thanks, thanks, Dr. Sushant. Very nice presentation. Now we'll shift to the last presentation by Dr. Prabhat Dutta. He is the additional director and HOD of transplant anesthesia and critical care. Any problem? And there is audio problem. Yeah, your, your uh, screen is on uh, now no visible, sir. Ask ma'am, can I start or? Ma'am, I think a problem had 
line it disturbances is it hello yes yes please you can start yes please okay thank you sir namaskar sir thank you for the opportunity actually lung transplant started in 1963 but its outcome improves very gradually so you can see by 2004 one year survival was around 81% and five years is less than 50% by 2010 it is one year survival came to 85 and five years more than 50% but latest around 2020 or one year survival is 92% and five years is more than 65% around 65% these improvements are largely attributed to better recognition and management of the post op complications along with the better preservative better immunosuppression uh, immunosuppression management with the surgical hands so i am going to focus my talk on specific issues of post op lung transplant only few things like very key, po uh, key points like ventilation strategy and nitric oxide primary gap dysfunction which sushan just now mentioned right ventricular dysfunction and how to handle it immunosuppression and rejection then small small slides of infection pain management and gi problems and bronchoscopy so ventilation the moment patient comes to our icu we just, we just give a mode of ventilation is a pressure control mode we start with f5 to 50% and then comes down gradually we try to maintain our pf ratio around more than 200 plus and uh, we manage the peep around 6 to 8 depends on the situation but we make sure our peak air pressure should be below 25 because bronchial sutures lines are there so we don't want to injure that thing and pf ratio like po2 to f5 to ratio has to be more than 200 at least because these are the guidelines for the pgd which i'll come later slides the moment patient comes to the icu we do the one abg then followed after 2 hours and correct the acidosis based balance then every 6th hour and as required one more thing like compliance the in our icu all staffs knows about the lung compliance they have to monitor if the lung compliance is coming down they has to inform us immediately that is we very much focused on that and post extubation we need bipap support to prevent vessel collapse next is nitric oxide see use of nitric oxide is a integral part of thoracic organ transplant we mainly use it for the rb dysfunction and prevention of pgd so both things we need to have a nitric oxide usually normal dose what sushan mentioned is 20 to 40 ppm so once the patient on nitric oxide it we starts in ot and shifted the patient to nitric oxide ventilator and we continue with that once the patient is hemodynamically stable we try to win the nitric oxide usually start up to 6 to 8 hours so just like any other cardiac surgery we start using the nitric oxide first then the patient will inform the ventilator so normally we reduce 4 to 5 ppm every 4 to 2 to 4 hourly and monitor the pulmonary pressure most of the uh, most of the lung patient patient have a pa catheter in c2 so we follow it this one the pa if the pa pressure you see when you reduce nitric oxide if the pa pressure keeps on rising in that case we do two things uh, we uh, reduction we do reduce slowly and we add step sildenafil 12.5 TDS as the patient meant, then we add some diuretics, and we then gradually reduce the nitric oxide. Once the nitric oxide is off, we wait for two to three hours, then put the patient on pressure control mode. If the patient is doing well with ABG wise and all, then we extubate the patient and take the patient out of the ventilator and put the patient on BiPAP. This is our nitric oxide machine and the ventilator set up for the post lung transplant. One thing I want to show you that. in this patient you can see this patient f5 to is giving 40% in the ventilator but patient actually is getting 34% because of the nitric oxide dilution so whenever you use these two machines you do, we need to be little careful how much actual patient is getting oxygen next is which sushant mentioned primary gap dysfunction this is one of the primary gap dysfunction is the type of severe lung injury that occurs within first 72 hours of lung transplantation and is the most common cause of early mortality the incidence is around 10 to 30% depends upon the various reports but nowadays it has come down compared to the previously stage 1 there is no uh, primary gap dysfunction which is called stage 0 where pf ratio is more than 300 and there is no x changes uh, stage 0 that's the stage 1 pf ratio is good but there is some x changes are there stage 2 is to pf ratio 2 to 300 but diffuse allograft infiltration you can see the in x rays stage 3 where the pf ratio is less than 200 and there is diffuse changes in your x rays so stage 2 if it is there you should be very careful it is better not to allow the patient go to stage 3 if the patient goes to stage 3 most of the time you will land up a patient on the vv ecmo so this is the patient after post of second day you can see the patient of stage 2 uh, pgd after 3 4 days he started improving gradually in the right hand side x rays so management of pgd prevention is always better than the cure so preoperatively we should take a proper organ selection ischemic time should be less which sushant mentioned at less than 6 hours is preferable 
Maximum you can go up to eight hours. Less blood transfusion. More blood transfusion you give chance of ejection and PGD is quite high. So post-op management is largely supportive. You need to get protective ventilation. Fluid management, you try to keep the EQ balance and keep little negative balance, but provided you need to follow your urea curtain very closely because if the patient develops renal failure, post op immunosuppression will be a problem for you, especially the tacrolimus. Nitric oxide use mainly. VV ECMO, if the PF threshold goes less than 150, we don't wait for anything, you just go for VV ECMO. And tracheostomy, if you decide as the patient needs, we can gauge the patient needs more than five days of ventilation, we go for tracheostomy. This is RV one, which we should mention. Most of the lung transplant patient having a mild to moderate pH, which leads to RV dysfunction. So this RV dysfunction, which Sushant has showed in the picture, this are severe RV. So you should, in ICU, you need to follow this very closely and don't allow the RV dysfunction to increase. Actually, you have to treat it so vigorously. So signs and symptoms usually starts with the low urine output, borderline BP, increased CVP and PA pressure. Cardiac output show, show that slowly is coming down and uh, cardiac output study will show the increase of PVR. ABG will be worsening of the PO2 and gradually increase of the acidosis. A mixed venous oxygen saturation start coming down. On echo, usually you, go, you see the RV is dilated, poor contractility, and worsening of the tricuspid regurgitation. Usually, you should not go up to this tricuspid regurgitation because if it goes there, usually end organ damage already start happening, like liver and kidney. So, recovery from that plot is become very difficult. So, management of RV dysfunction, we need to be very proactive. Reduce afterload by using nitric oxide and followed by mulinol. Maintain contractility, we can use low dose adrenaline. Sometimes the heart rate comes down. So we have a pacing where usually pace this patient at 80 to 90 beats per minute. Maintain perfusion pressure to maintain the end organ perfusion. Sometimes you have to add NORAD or vasopressin, depends on the choice of the department. Avoid fluid overload, use judicial use of diuretics. But if the persistent hemodynamic instability is there, you have to go for VA ECMO. Otherwise, your end organ will damage will be performed and the patient develops multi-organ failure. Next is immunosuppression, which is a very integral part of the transplant surgeries. So as well, normal, we use the triple drug regime, solumetal and steroid, tacrolimus and myphotic. Second dose of similar, sometimes you consider, in case of renal dysfunction, when you cannot give the tacrolimus, the first dose of which Sushant mentioned, you give in the 40, and second dose, you usually give after 96 hours of the first dose. But provided patient receives less blood transfusion, if patient uses more blood transfusion in that case, you have to prepond your second dose of simulant. So this is our Kim's protocol of the immunosuppression, usually pre of which Sushant mentioned and intra, post of zero day, usually give only solid metal 125 milligram per kg uh, uh, IV BD twice. Then uh, first day we give solid metal, we reduce the solid metal dose and first post of the we add the myphotic. Second post of day, we give solumetrol, we reduce the solumetrol dose, continue the myphotic and add tacrolimus sublingually. In India, we don't get a IV uh, tacrolimus. So to overcome it, to increase its viability, we give tacrolimus sublingually, provided patient urea is fine. Day three to day eight, usually this patient time patient will be in ICU. We reduce the uh, solumetrol to oral to oisalon around 20 milligram OD, increase the myphotic dose around 360 BD if the patient is more than 70 kilos and increase the tack level slowly, gradually as uh, to achieve this blood level. Few more points about the immunosuppressions. So once tack level crosses five, so we change the sublingual dose to the oral dose and check the tack and which always every 48 hours, you check the tacrolimus level and with the renal function. Target tack level is 10 to 12. And if the creatinine is 1.8, we always consider the give the second dose of simulate and deferred attack level, given tag for another three to four days, total seven days. In case of low blood count and GI symptoms, we have to reduce the myphotic dose. Next is rejection, which is only small two slides I'll put there. Three types of rejection, hyperacute, acute, and chronic. Hyperacute which occurs within few hours. Usually it happens in the OT, but nowadays it's very rare because of the extensive pre-op uh, investigation and checking. So very rare it happens. Acute happens within few hours to few days. Usually it happens in the ICU setup. So this patient is usually have a recipient has a preformed uh, donor specific antigen. Uh, so that, that attacks the new organ and there is rapid activation in T and B cells. Chronic is happens one, two years. So for that we have a surveillance biopsy. Usually it happens the development of de novo, a DSA and uh, antibody mediated rejection, AMR, which is called. So treatment wise, 
Diagnosis depends on not only the two, three things, clinical, blood test, and pathological. Pathology is the final, that is biopsy. Treatment, usually give high dose of steroid. We give solumetal 10 milligram per kg. We give at least three days we give, then we taper it slowly. Plasma pseudosis we do, we usually do five cycles of plasma pseudosis, each cycle is around four hours, and followed by IVIG five gram every day. So it is around five days, so total 10 days. And after third dose of third phase of plasma pseudosis, we usually give injection botulinum around two milligram. We give it over half an hour to one hour. Next is infection control. As you know, this patient is transplant, so they will remove, get the immunosuppression. So any infection is very detrimental for this patient's survival and recovery. So we focus on the hand hygiene. Isolation room, there usually nobody goes. We have this isolation with a HEPA filter with separate air handling unit. One is to one nursing. Very less stuff. Very few people go there. We have a glass door. In fact, only nursing staff goes inside. Even doctors, we also see from only one goes inside and see. Remaining is for, see from the outside. And frequent bowel and blood culture as and when required. Our protocol, we give antibody prophylaxis. Usually, we use the targosid and meropenem. Antifungal, the ones the patient started uh, orally uh, take uh, absorb GI absorption, which is good at the third or fourth post of day. We start voriconazole 200 milligram OD. Inhale amphotericin, we keep it reserved. If there is some bronchoscopically changes are there, then we add it. For CMB prophylaxis, same, we give the vancel with around 450 milligram OD. IV also reserved if there is a culture positive for CMB, we go for IV vancel. In that case, you have to follow the liver and kidney function very closely. For pneumocystic kidney, after seven days of transplant, the patient is good, palliated count is more than a lakh, we start some bacterium. Pain management is very important. This is morbid, this, you can see this morbid infection, bilateral thoracotomy, we call it clamshell. So pain will be intense. So prevention, control of pain, improves respiratory effort, reduce atelectasis, facilitates winning from ventilation, resulting in decreased length in ICU stay and improve patient satisfaction. This is essential for early extubation and patient involvement in active physiotherapy. Pre-op patient education is must. IV opioids with IV paracetamol we use. Thoracic epidural we can consider, but there are two issues. One is patient get heparin in OT, and these patients and pre-operatively want a lot of oxygen support. So getting a proper position for giving epidural sometimes is very, uh, very challenging. Palliative catheter through surgical we can put, and we give some medications. And in our setup, we early removal of chest tubes we follow. The moment chest drain comes down around last six or less than 100, we just remove the chest tube after ultrasound. So blood transfusion and bleeding. See, more blood transfusion you give is a more immunogenicity and the chance of rejection will be high. So goal is minimal transfusion. Check ACT immediately after arrival and after two hours. This is just for to cover the heparin rebound, which is happened mostly after the heparin of six, seven of surgery. We follow, we check the INR fibrinogen and take in ICU and we give the targeted product replacement. Target HB, we can maintain it at 8 gram percent. If you give massive blood transfusion, it entails repeat of those of immunosuppression and checking of donor specific antigens because chance of rejection is very high in these patients. So you should closely monitor these patients. Bronchoscopy is an integral part of the lung transplant to intubation, to check the double lumen site to the post up. So, first bronchoscopy is usually done in the operating room before chest closure. And we do it to assess the anastomotical site, clear the blood clot and secretion. Collect blood sample for culture to, to rule out PGD, any lower torsion, uh, torsion and compression before chest closure. Serial bronchoscopy usually do second and third post of day as per the patient clinical condition, X-ray, ABG, and USG chest. Bronchoscopy may be needed as to clear out the incipitous secretion because these patients' mucociliary function is takes time to come back. Uh, so they retain secretion and they due to the that incision, the cough reflex is very low. So we should keep in mind. So if required, we just go, go ahead and do the bronchoscopy. Yeah, this is the she is doing. You can see the anastomosis at the right. This is the left anastomosis side. You can check it and usually keep it in the photo when you cross to the it with the photo and we check the, all the segments. So, GI management many patients have a gastroparesis in early post op due to extensive dissection and or pre op dis, uh, dysfunction. This pre op usually ILD patients have this. So we give IV supplement in every early stage with minimal enteral fit as tolerated. In our ICU, we give, start with water, 100 ml, 4,000 in adult. If the tolerance, we go for diluted milk or coconut oil. If the tolerance that, then we go for thoroughly half semi-digested fluid like peptamine. Then gradually escalates to enteral fit to each 
to reach the caloric need. In this time, we involve our dietitian every time. Uh, to avoid we should avoid aspiration because it leads to infection in short term and chronic dejection in long term. Thus, assessing vocal cord function and solo test is must before oral intake. So, as a protocol, we always do it in our ICU and we have to document it from the ENT people. Prokinetic, we can add. Usually, we add metoclopramide or etoclopramide depends upon the uh, institute's choice. Antacid interface with the TAC absorption. So, we, we always space two hours be before giving these two drugs. So key takeaway, post-op outcomes depends on meticulous attention to detail to avoid complications. Follow your protocols, institute and early recognition of complications, early management of complications when they occur. And we need a multidisciplinary team approach. In this team, your nursing staff, physiotherapist, dietitian is very important. Then comes the intensivist, pulmonologist and the surgeons. Uh, which madam was asking, this is our statistics. Till now, our team has done a 368 thoracic organ transplant. In that 229 is the lung transplant and heart transplant, we have done around 95. Combined heart lung, we have done 44. COVID lung, we have done 29, which is mostly it is the highest in the world. After joining Kims, we have done 130 transplant. This, thank you. This is our XVO, which we started done last uh, in beginning of this year. So we should call you call breathing lung. Thank you, ma'am, and the team. Thank you, Dr. Prabhat. It's a very nice presentation. A lot of uh, information, a lot of, uh, we have gained a lot of knowledge uh, with this. And uh, I think um, I'd like to ask some inputs from our seniors, whoever is there. Gopinath sir, Padmaja madam. I think our experience in this topic is very limited. So all that we can do is appreciate what they said. <laughs> Yeah. Ma'am, you are always welcome Very to nice come to Thank you. Ma'am, you are always welcome to come to our center, ma'am. Anytime. Yeah, thank you. And we'll have a conference. We are arranging this time, which Sushant mentioned is Hyderabad only. End of the Yeah, I think we should uh, try and attend that and gain some knowledge. So welcome, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to talk with you because I am very new in this city, just two years. But it's very nice of you to allow me to talk. Yeah, it's very nice, actually. Yeah. I think we are at a very nascent stage. It's very nice to learn from you both. Thank you. <laughs> ma'am, nothing like that, ma'am. We are learning, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, any Thank questions? You. Yeah, I was just asking any questions. I didn't see any in the chat box, too. Uh, Umesh suggests I want to ask only one small question that you told the ECGs that they're doing are 45 years because a few studies they're telling you do it around 40, 35 because the, our uh, population is getting coronavirus more frequently in the lower age. Sir, yeah, uh, we did uh, go through recently published evidence. Yes, uh, two meta analysis and one uh, systematic review was available in this from the Indian population only. And yes, uh, as per that, which was published in the year 2021 only, the okay, age group at risk is 45 years and above. So based on that, we, we have done this. Sir. If any evidence, uh, strong evidence emerges at a lower age, we will definitely, uh, this, now these guidelines are called as living guidelines, where as soon as new evidence comes, we will update only that part of the evidence. Okay, so thank you, sir. Actually, what yes. happened in hospital nowadays, we saw any patient, they... 35, they usually automatically, which Gopinath was telling, they get an ECG and come to the uh, PSE. So they don't follow that thing. So that Problem is uh, routinely doing that, no, sir, will result in some or the other abnormality being detected. And because the anesthesiologist becomes apprehensive because there is RDVB or some one or two T wave inversions, then it goes to cardiologist and it delays the surgery also. Exactly. It doesn't really the resources out. also. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah, the same thing, Dr. Umesh. Actually, we had one patient, uh, it's a semi-emergency, acute appendicitis, that was routinely done. He was some, I think, 20, 25, 28 years uh, age, but it was routinely done, the ECG, and uh, the ECG has showed significant STT changes. And then we asked for an echo, and then he had like uh, severe uh, ca cardiac, dis uh, cardiac dysfunction. So, it's a very rare thing, but it it's also there, like. So but nothing there are history. no symptoms at all. Oh, okay, okay. No symptoms. Uh, so, 
that's a very rare presentation but it was there we had this patient the problem is to detect one mm -hmm. such thing maybe we will have to do one lakh investigation so yeah yeah that's yeah. and the other thing i had uh, umesh and this uh, nowadays on varicose surgeries uh, they are doing laser guided to most of the surgeries so i don't know where to place it like whether for an intermediate or minor it goes into yeah true madam there are so many varieties of surgeries so what we thought was we will make one uh, google form and we will keep updating as and when new surgical names terminologies or surgical procedures come up and we'll ask our 16 experts to um, you know give their opinion as to where to place it See, we want it to be consensus based where majority like more than 75% out of 16 experts minimum 12 should say yes this should come under minimum uh, or uh, intermediate or high risk or high uh, major surgery then it will be categorized accordingly and similarly for like um, ripples procedures usually it's a major that is definitely a major surgery yes yeah so it was uh, just a scary because it was not in the list i was a little correct uh, yeah yes we just commonly performed the 30 to 40 surgeries and those which were there in the list of articles, the studies which we had reviewed. So we clubbed all of them together and uh, took opinion from the experts and categorized accordingly. But yeah, it's an exhaustive list. We may be having around 200, 300 uh, names. So we'll have to categorize them accordingly. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Umesh, very much. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. thanks, Dr. Prabhat and Dr. Thank Shushan. You. It's a very nice presentation. Like they have gained a lot of knowledge from your uh, whatever experience. And thanks, Umesh. Thanks. The, the bronchoscopy videos, no, they just take your mind directly there. That's you true. get excited at that video. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing those videos. Thank you, sir. Anytime you do, come to this place, come to our place, sir. Yes, sir. Sure, definitely. <laughs> Same to ma'am. Thank you. Ah, yeah, welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very you, much. Ma'am. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Ramkrishna, Dr. Ratnaka, you would like to say something? Uh, thank you, Dr. Umesh, Dr. Uh, Sushant, Dr. Prabhat. Excellent presentation and uh, we learned so many things and excellent inputs by Dr. Gopina, sir. Thank you, Dr. Silata, for arranging such an academic program. Very interesting and very useful. Thank you so much. We, would, we look forward uh, for such programs from you again. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Good night. Good night. Happy Good weekend night. to all. <laughs> Good night. Everybody. All weekend this time for us. <laughs> Good night, madam. Good night, Good sir. Good night.